Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to uh, complete the study for this week, this morning, try to see if we can get this uh, historical application sort of sorted out. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have to study here this morning, so we invite your Spirit's presence here. We ask for your angels to watch over um, each one of us and, and those that we love, and uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit can go before us and all that we come in contact with today. We ask that the things that we study will be to your glory, and um, we pray, Lord, for your continued guidance and enlightenment uh, that reveals to us our need of you and your power to work in our lives. So we give this time over to you, Lord, and we ask that um, you can lead, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So uh, yesterday we were uh, discussing Swearingen's uh, interpretation of uh, this, what was the, uh, when the, how, how did it go? I'm trying to see here exactly what the phrase was. Yeah. So there's going to be where they move the capital. It comes toward the south. That's in verse 29 at the bottom there. Um, shall return and come toward the south. And he uses this as the movement of the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople toward Egypt, but not into Egypt itself. So if we look at a map of the world, uh, where is Constantinople in relation to Rome? Isn't it toward the east? Yeah, so I would say it's towards the east. I wouldn't call it towards the south. So I'm kind of puzzled. It's almost basically directly straight east. So I have no idea what um, Swearingen is trying to say here. Now, can we make sense out of what he's trying to say? Now, now also, I mean, it's hard to tell here. I mean, he says, come toward the south. Well, that's kind of an interpretive use of uh, Hebrew into English. I'm, I'm not sure whether they choose come over go towards the south, because the word uh, bo, which is translated there as come, means to go or to come, right? Because in, in Hebrew, just like they don't, they don't have a here and a there, a this and a that, they don't really have a distinction between go and come. Right. So some a distinction in English, but not a distinction in Hebrew. And and this word can mean lots of other things. It can mean abide, uh, besiege, uh, bring forth. Right. So generally it's it's something in the context that would kind of uh, help you understand what what it's referring to. And, and we've run into this word lots of times. It just usually you don't see it translated as come. So it says, at the time appointed. So we know that this is 330. That's at least how we've interpreted this. You're going to see this here. It's it, The end shall be at the time appointed in verse 27, which is Moed, and then in verse 29. Now, the time appointed is also referred to in uh, Daniel chapter 8. So if we go here, it's in Daniel 8, 19 as well. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be at the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. So there's a last end of the indignation, and then there is obviously then a first end of the indignation. And and I always have taken that to be uh, the two 1260s. So the first end is the one that's in Daniel chapter 12, the first 1260, and then the last end, that indignation. That's the papacy, so that's the 1260 years. So he's going to let him know in verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 19, what shall be at, in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed the end shall be the Moed, which I've always taken as referring to 1844. So that means that what's being talked about here is the period of time from 1798 to 1844. And so in order to understand that, he's going to go through and explain uh, the vision that he saw in chapter 8. So, so I've always looked at the time appointed having to do with the Moed as then some reference to the Jewish uh, Day of Atonement, right? So the Jewish feasts, that's the idea, could refer to any feast. So in verse 29 then, and verse 27, where it talks about, uh, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Uh, do we take this in this word being used 
in context of Daniel, because Daniel 8 is also part of this context, even though it's a different vision, that it has something to do with the Jewish system being a Moed. Or are we just going to take it as a general sense? It's just some kind of appointed time. I don't know if that I said that clearly or not, because if the time appointed is here between eight, so he says, Swearingen says, between AD 330, he shall return to the Eastern Territories. Now, we already addressed, you know, this Eastern Territories idea and come towards the South, move the capital of Rome, Roman Empire to Constantinople towards Egypt. Now, if you're dealing with the, I just don't understand how this is, I don't understand what he's saying. So maybe I need to look at his paper a bit more and try to see what, what he's trying to get at. I mean, we looked at it a bit last time. So let's, let's take a look at it again. So he says, at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former as at the latter. The passage points out that the Roman Empire, at the time appointed, the end of the 360 year prophecy, would return by coming toward, not to the south. This return would not be like the former time when Octavian, the king of the north, conquered Egypt in 30 BC, or the latter time, the future conquest of Egypt by the king of the north in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. But peacefully, without intention of waging war, this passage actually reached its fulfillment when the emperor Constantine the Great uh, moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, thus proclaiming relocating the imperial capital capital toward Egypt, that is in the direction of Egypt, but not exactly to Egypt itself, having peaceful intentions. Well, I don't see that it's it's toward Egypt or in the direction of Egypt, unless you're saying that Egypt, you know, part of its kingdom is is further to the east. Now, Constantine the Great came to power under the interesting series of events, an interesting series of events, when pagan Emperor Diocletian came to power. He sought for a way to contain the Germanic invasions along the Roman frontier borders. It caused considerable political and economic upheaval. Diocletian believed that these, these crises could be handled more efficiently by delegating imperial authority. So he created a system of government called the Tetrarchy. This system would divide the empire into two halves, east and west, two co-emperors called Augusti. We read this before uh, yesterday. Um, so in AD 305, both Diocletian and his co-emperor Maximian, or however you say his name, would abdicate their emperorships and be replaced by Constantius and Galerius. After the short-lived reign of Constantius, who died in AD 306, his son Constantine was declared emperor in his stead by his troops in Britain and Gaul. Two other rivals, Maxentius and Lucinius, also became contenders for the emperorship. Now, this is hard for me to keep track of names. I'm bad with names itself. Some of these names are similar, um, so I not, can, can't keep them straight in my head. As it turned out, Constantine would eventually meet Maxentius in a battle that took place just north of Rome at the Tiber River at a place called the Milvian Bridge in AD 312. After routing the superior forces of his rival, who drowned in the Tiber River during a hasty retreat, Constantine would emerge as the undisputed Augustus of the West, and having attributed his victory to Christ's intervention, he would profess to convert to Christianity. Later, after the death of Galerius, AD 311, Licinius, an ally of Constantine, would defeat the rival Maximinus in a battle near Adrianople, um, and became the Augustus of the East, having entered into a marriage alliance together, Constantine and Licinius would sign the famous Edict of Milan, which would grant religious freedom to every citizen in the Roman Empire. So that's that. We, we, we've looked at that already. So 313. Christianity would be the special benefactor of this edict because it would essentially bring an end to Christian persecution. A portion of this actual edict stated that um, we, Constantine and Licinius, have resolved among the first things to ordain those matters by which reverence and worship to the deity might be exhibited. That is, how we may grant likewise to the Christians and to all the free choice to follow that mode of worship which they may wish. Therefore, we have decreed the following ordinance as our will, that no freedom at all shall be refused to Christians, 
but that to each one power be granted to devote his mind to that worship which he may think adapted to himself. Constantine would eventually become estranged from Licinius to the point of war because of specific border disputes and would later defeat him in three successive battles. He dissolved the Tetrarchy for a time, ruling as the sole emperor until his death in 337. By holding this position, he was able to elevate and promote Christianity to where it would later become the state religion of the empire. In this process, he would also empower the Bishop of Rome with both religious and political authority in the West. As stated earlier, uh, Constantine would also seek to relocate the imperial capital, capital of the empire after realizing that Rome was not a practical location for effective governance. He selected the site of Byzantinium, located at modern-day Istanbul, Turkey, and built a new imperial capital there called Constantinople, dedicated in 8330 at the end of the 360-year uh, prophecy from 31 BC to 330 AD. Uh, this um, new imperial city would eventually become the future metropolis of the empire. Thus, with the emperor now reigning primarily from the east, Roman political authority in the west would eventually transition into the hands of the bishop of Rome, papacy, who would later be left free to exercise religious and political authority over western Europe. Stated before, this authority would continue to strengthen over time until the papal ascendancy would become a reality by March of AD 538. So it doesn't really explain uh, coming towards the south. I mean, he, he I, I'm not sure how that could be. Is there territory of Egypt that's to the east that brings him the capital closer? Is that what he's trying to say? Does Egypt have Syria at the time? I mean, in a sense, even though it, I mean, it is straight east, east, it is more north of Egypt. So maybe that's what's intended there. I can show you the map here. So, so you can see here's, here's a map. You can see over here is, is Cairo. So this is the capital of Egypt. And, and you can see, you know, it's, it's obviously closer to the capital of Egypt by moving over here. And it does bring them closer to, um, as far as land, uh, to Egypt, right? Rather than Rome over here and Egypt, you have all this Mediterranean to go through. But is that what you think? Is that what he means? Is that what the Bible means? Toward the south? And, and then does the Hebrew support that idea? Because it, it doesn't really say toward the south. It just says, you know, in Hebrew, uh, moed, shuv, bo, which is the word come, and then south. Now, if I look at the Hebrew itself, if I have a lamed in front of south, then maybe that might. But actually what I have is is not a lamed. I have a bet. So we have the, the Hebrew letter bet. That's a B, right? In front of Negev. The bet normally means in. Now, if I had Lamed, that would mean uh, two. Lamed is the L sound, of course. So uh, I'm just going to look up here. Uh, bet Hebrew prefix. What does it say about this? In or at. I would argue that it's probably not a good translation to say that bet is uh, the like towards the south, it would mean in or at the south. Does that make sense? So I don't know if I would agree with it. Any thoughts on that? Okay, first, when we looked at that map, okay, go back. The, 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 the one that you just had up, Yeah. looking at that, and I'm almost thinking that Rome and Constantinople are almost on the same latitude, that Constantinople looks to be... Yeah, they're on the same latitude. Yeah, yep, they're on the same latitude. But when you move from Rome to Constantinople, Cairo and and Constantinople are on the same longitude. Okay, but the point is Cairo and Constantinople, Constantinople is further north from Cairo. And that part I understand. Yeah. I had thought, you know, I understand what you were presenting here, showing mm -hmm. the letter. Bet, B-E-T, Bravo, Echo, Tango. 
Well, it's just a, it's just the letter bet. Yeah. So bet. Yeah. Okay, um, but as as you were approaching that in the definition, when you typed in Bravo Echo Tango Hotel, yeah, I, I thought that instead of being a preposition of at would have been more house of. Or am I now completely incorrect on that? Yeah, you're completely incorrect. I mean, what, what you're what you're looking at is the word aleph in Hebrew is ox. The word like the letter aleph is is just what they did is they take the word ox and you take the first word letter of the word ox, which in Hebrew is, aleph is the a ah, the aleph letter, and that. That word ox and represents the first letter of that word represents the, the name of the letter. And bet means house. So that's just the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so that's for the B sound. So they just name the letter after a word that has that let that has the first letter of that word, right? It would be like if we had an alphabet where the first letter of the alphabet we called apple and the second letter of the alphabet we call bread and you know the third letter was called cake right does that make sense i can't hear you is is that what you were trying to talk about like the word house dwight you're not there so anyway so the idea is that bet the b sound at added as a prefix to a word a prefix means in if i put a lamed the l in front of of Negev, that would mean uh, to or against. And so I don't think his his idea that they come toward the south as it's being toward not to is actually a correct translation of the Hebrew. Now, it might be true that it, it's closer to the capital of Egypt. And then also we know that the word south is Negev, right? So that's that's actually referring to a desert and usually refers to the south from the idea that the south is south of Israel. I don't think if you have something north of Israel that you're going to call it the Negev because all directions are in relationship to the land of Israel itself. So I I think it's hard to kind of say that this is coming towards the south refers to the movement of the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople toward Egypt, but not into Egypt itself. I don't think that that makes sense. Any thoughts on this? For some reason we don't have Dwight here. He's he's there, but he's not. So this verse 29, there's a lot that um, when we address this a time appointed, we need to we need to figure out what this is talking about. And I have this as H1450. I think it should be 4150, the Hebrew. I don't know how I ended up with that. 4150. I'm not sure. I typed that in wrong. 4150. Okay, so we got. The end shall be at the time appointed, and at the time appointed he shall return and come. Come, he shall uh, go go in the south or at the south, but it shall not be as the former. And so this other part, as the former, is and as at the lat or as the latter. So the former, obviously, that would refer to the, the what happened in 30 A.D. with uh, the defeat of Egypt being taken over as part of the Roman Empire. But the latter being what we would call 1989, because that's going to be the king of the north and the king of the south. And Swearingen shares in the same view that we do regarding, uh, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union as uh, Daniel 11, verse 40b. So, So he has some similarities. He doesn't call it the time of the end, though. So we have this time appointed. What are we going to do with it? And I don't know what Dwight's doing. But. I had to step out for just a moment. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I figured you had to. Did you hear any of my explanation about uh, the bet? I, the heard, I, I heard a good bit of it, yes. Okay. Yeah, so that makes sense. That's kind of what you were suggesting because you know bet means house. Correct. Yeah. And so it's just the letter at the beginning of a word. And you can see why it, why it means in because it's a pictorial language. Correct. Right. So the idea of in, you use a picture of a house. So the idea that this is toward the south, but not into Egypt itself, would not be in agreement with the Hebrew. Because right. that word that means in or at. 
but the, okay. the other the other part of this in going into is also in line with that instead of this being into a country, we're talking into a symbol. Okay. Well, this is ne- the Negev. So, right. yeah, uh, I mean, I understand it's a symbol, but it is, it's a pretty literally interpreted symbol. The South, the reason why it's called the South is because it's South of Israel, not South of Rome. Okay. Right. So, so if, if you're moving East and you're still North of Israel, I don't see how that could be even coming toward the South from, from Daniel's perspective. He would not, you know, understand that uh, going straight east as coming toward the South, even if it was just toward. So we would have to, we'd have to try to figure out what this means. And we know that this is, this is literal history that we're talking about first here. So this time appointed, you know, it's in verse 27 and 29. And, and, and yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And it's in 819 as well. The time appointed, the end shall be. So we got this time appointed. You know, does this have any relation to 819? Because it seems to me he's sort of forcing an interpretation upon the Hebrew here that doesn't, we just have to figure out if he's correct or not. Now we can agree when we go back to verse 27, when it says both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. We, we can say, well, that's definitely Octavian and Antony. Now, then it says, for yet, the end shall be at the time appointed. So we do have some Hebrew words there. So this word translated, um, well, what, what they have is for and yet. Sometimes they don't translate well in, into English, but it's here. So this word translated as for is key. My, my uh, friend uh, David Kadosh, when he would talk to his mom in Hebrew, he'd always go key, key, key all the time which basically means uh, yes or surely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now here they translate it as yet or for, or they translate it as for, but it can be translated as the word yet. And then the word yet is this word od, which means properly an iteration or continuance. So the idea is that, yea, it shall continue to the end which is the time appointed. So the idea is that this is a, is a continuous. So th- that word od is in, um, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter seven, where it talks about within 65 years, that the word od is translated as within. So it's probably better translated as yet, yet 65 years, not within 65 years, but there's other ways that, that it could be translated too. So. So what do we do with this Moed? Uh, and the first time we run into that word yet, uh, by the way, is in Genesis dealing with um, yet seven days and it will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And it's also translated as uh, more in Genesis chapter eight, uh, when, as again in Genesis 4.25. So it's the first time Adam knew his wife again and she bare a son and called his name Seth. So I think that's the earliest. It's translated lots of different ways. So So they speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Or we could say truly, right, for the word for, truly it shall continue to the end at the time appointed. So what's going to continue? What's going to be? Now, if we think of it as an iteration, that's actually type a type of repetition. So could this verse 27 be saying, these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. And we need to, you know, so speak is the bar, lies is just falsehood. Uh, one ichad table shalchan, that is to spread out a table as a meal, right? That's the idea of a table there. Uh, but it shall not prosper. And the idea of prosper is it shall not push forward. Right, sort of like progress, it shall not progress. For truly, it shall continue or even repeated, be reiterated at the end of the time appointed. So could this be referring to our time, saying that just as Octavian and Antony have these ambitions and they speak lies at one table and it's not going to continue, 
that will also be true at the end of time, the time appointed. Would that make sense? Or am I really stretching, uh, stretching the idea here? I think that is a bit of a stretch. So when, why is this there, this iteration? Why does it say for yet uh, the end and that end is, is the extremity shall be at the time appointed. So it's pointing to the extremity of something, which it's using the word, he, the Hebrew word moed to refer to. Right. Right. And that would put it to 1844 if we're going to, uh, cause that's how I've understood Daniel 8, 19, because in Daniel 8, 19, where it says, um, for at the time appointed the end shall be, right? And I thought there was, uh, yeah, yeah, the time appointed the end shall be. And that's going to have the same word appointed and end. And it's also going to have uh, that word key, certainly, right? For at the time appointed, certainly at the time appointed the end shall be. At the moed, the end shall be. And, th- and that's where he wants to know what shall be at the last end of the indignation. The indignation being these periods of 1260 years. So if it's related to that, we, we should be able to see that there's some connection to that. So what I'm suggesting is that this history here is typical of a later history. But then we're going to have where it says in verse 29, at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south. But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Now, I don't agree with him that the latter would be the one in the last days, because he must be referring uh, to events that have already occurred in the line of this prophecy, because there's there's two events. One's the former, one's the latter. And, and he's arguing that the former is the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, and that the latter is 1989. And, and I don't think that makes sense in the context here. It's true, there is, uh, it's going to be typical of that, but there's going to be a time appointed where he should return and come toward the south, but it's not going to be as the former or the latter. And what, so we need to know what the former and the latter events are when um, the king of the north returns and comes toward the south. Because the former could refer to, to something before 30 BC, and the latter could refer to 30 BC itself. And remember, it says, uh, the ships of, of Kittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Right. So we're going to get uh, this issue dealing with the fall of Rome. And then we have to figure out what this holy covenant is. And that and that holy there is the word Kodesh uh, and the covenant Berit. So holy covenant has to refer to something that is indeed a holy covenant. So he's going to have indignation against this holy covenant. And, and so shall he do. Right. He shall even return and have intelligence. And, and that word just means understanding. So it's, it's not in the sense of, you know, have intelligence in the sense of, uh, like, um, you know, like spies, that type of intelligence, right? It's not some kind of, uh, spy. It just means to understand, consider diligently, discern. So he's, um, or have knowledge, perceive, be prudent, right? So it's not, it's, it basically means to understand, even to deal wisely with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then, you know, we're going to have the part where arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, right? And shall take away the daily and shall place the abomination that make it desolate. So we know when that is, we're going to have 508 to 538. So I don't think we can just put the coming toward the south as 330. So any ideas on how we can resolve this? I'm not happy with Swearingen's interpretation. Now, he, now Smith is going to say the time appointed is probably the prophetic time of verse 24, which had been previously mentioned, right? So uh, 360 years. It closed, as already shown, in AD 330, at which time this power was to return and come again toward the south, but not as on the former occasion when it went into Egypt, nor as the latter when it, when it went into Judea, these were expeditions which resulted in conquest and glory. This one led to demoralization and ruin, 
the removal of the seat of the empire to Constantinople was the signal for the downfall of the empire. Rome was then lost its prestige. The Western division was exposed to the incursions of the foreign enemies. On the death of Constantine, the Roman Empire was divided among his three sons, right? Right. So then this is going to lead. Now, I think, I think Uriah Smith's got it a bit better. So he's going to come towards the south. So at the time appointed, he shall return, but he shall not be as the former as the latter. So he's going to have uh, the conquest of Egypt in 30 AD and then in Judea. I'm not sure specifically what he's referring to, uh, which, which event, because we know obviously they were conquered in 63 uh, BC. Is there any way that we can resolve this? There's a lot of information here, a lot of things that have to be considered. As Smith and to some extent Swearingen have been presenting, they're looking at this more in a, in a historical application and right, much of that. have to look at. That's um, what it is, historical application. And so what we're trying to do is to look at this as to how this could be not just in the prior historical application, but also within our historical application, right? Yeah, well, definitely it's typical. But first we need, in order to know the antitype, we need to know the type. Okay. Right. So we have to have the correct historical application first. All right. But we don't start with the application in our time and then try to make the historical fit what we think it should. We look at the historical. We know we have this holy covenant and, and we're obviously will have an application to our time. And we know that history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated, right? And that's why I was just saying about the fact that it has, for yet, uh, the end shall be at the time appointed. So what, what I'm suggesting about the time appointed is it's actually referring to a time that's much further off. That is the idea that I'm, that I'm suggesting is within the text itself, it's telling you that what's happening here is going to be repeated at the end. So one thing we could say about uh, verse 29, at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Now, so we have a time appointed here, and then we say, well, it says at the end shall be the time appointed. And if I'm saying that that's something in the future, then there would be another, either this time appointed in verse 29 is the same one in the future. And, and so we could say at this time appointed, this is going to be 1798 or 1989. So we could argue that one is 1798, one's 1989, and that it's talking about what's going to happen in Daniel 11, verse 40. That's one way of looking at it. And then, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So the former, in my view, would be when they conquered Egypt. And then for the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved in return. And have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have knowledge with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So I have quite a different interpretation. If, I, if I'm going to interpret this the way that I'm thinking it makes sense. Here, I'm, I'm going to switch screens so we can just look at the scripture itself. Okay, so in verse 27, you're going to have Antony and Octavian. Uh, speaking lies at one table. So they're going to go back, even though they've dealt with, you know, this battle of, of Actium already. They're now they're going to go back and talk about what these two people who fought the battle of Actium were doing. They had an alliance and it was in both of their hearts to do mischief. But they speak the lies at one table. So they're in this type of fellowship, but they both speak lies. And, and it's not going to prosper. And then it says, for yet shall be, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And I'm saying that that is referring to an iteration. That this, this history is typifying something that's going to happen in the future. This time appointed is something that Daniel speaks of that's going to refer to Millerite history. But we also know and, and specifically 1798 to 1844. But then it says, then he shall return into his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. So obviously this can't be referring to Augustus. This has to be Rome. Rome is against the holy covenant. He shall do 
and return into his own land. So this, that we still have to kind of figure out exactly what it's referring to, what event. And then it said, again, it brings up the time appointed. It says, at the time appointed, he shall return. Now, when you have this word return, we, we, we know this word keeps showing up. So he returns into his land with great riches. But now there's going to be this time appointed and he shall return and come toward the south. Now, if we're saying that the first time appointed in verse 27 is referring to 1798, is it possible that Daniel 1129, the time appointed here, refers to 1989, that it's referring to that event? And it shall not be as the former, right, because he's going to come towards the south when he conquered Egypt the first time. And it's not going to be as the latter. And if we're going to put it here as the latter, uh, we could put it some other time. I don't know if I would put it, you know, as 1989, because it says if the time appointed is referring to 1989, it must mean some other time. And that time, I would think, is going to be when Rome is conquered, because it's going to refer to the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved. But I'm still not certain that, that that's what it's referring to. I'm just saying it's a su- suggestion. And again, it's going to have that word shub, return, and return. He shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, right? So indignation against the Holy Covenant is the persecution of Christians under pagan Rome. So shall he do. He shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Well, those would be apostate Christianity. And then when it says arms shall stand on his part, they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. So we're, we're understanding that this has to do with uh, the take away, the taking away of the daily, the sanctuary of st- strength being Rome and the placing or the giving of the abomination that make it desolate where they shall place is Natan, a gift. Right. So they shall give the abomination that make it desolate and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt, corrupted or corrupt. Shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that know their God shall be strong and do. Again, they put exploits in there. So we're going to have God's people that are going to survive this persecution. Verse 33, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. So this is God's people. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. So this is, we understand this history of the Dark Ages, right? You have Ellen White talks about these verses. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white. Even to the time of the end. Because it is yet for a time appointed. So here we have the time of the end being referred to as the time appointed. And it's going to be the same uh, Hebrew words, ki and od. So could they say for yet it is at the time appointed. It is the time appointed. But they say because it is yet for a time appointed. And then we know. For the king shall do according to his will and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. So again, you have this indignation and that's going to be the end of the 1260 years. For that that is determined shall be done. Right? Uh, Karats. And, and then it's going to go and describe the papacy paralleling second Thessalonians chapter two. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, knowing that he is God. That's Second Thessalonians. That's one of the arguments James White uses to show that this is referring to the papacy, not to France. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces or fortresses. And the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. 
And that's when we get, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So the king of the south is going to push at the king of the north, and the king of the north is going to come against him like a whirlwind. 1798, 1989. So can we see that possibly, this is a different interpretation of these passages, but can we see how this would naturally flow into verse 40? If we take this interpretation of the time appointed in verse 27 and um, verse 29 and uh, verse, whichever verse it was, uh, verse 25, that these are all talking about the same time appointed and that this can't possibly be referring to 330 A.D. Any thoughts on that? All right. As we have been examining Daniel 1127. Mm -hmm. The translators tied Daniel 11.27 with several other verses within Daniel, one of which was Daniel 8.19. Right, and that's just because it's got the same word. Because it's beginning this time appointed, right? Yeah, the time appointed. That's why they're tying it together. Yeah. So the symbolism... In this time appointed, beginning with Daniel 8.19, takes us through the progression from Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, right? Well, yes, except that when it's talking about the time appointed in in 8.19, my understanding of this verse has always been, uh, I'm going to show you what shall be at the last end of the indignation. That is, the 1260 years that end. So that's 1798. The last end of the indignation. And even if you just took the indignation as, you know, the 2520 persecution, you know, you, but the first end is the first 1260. The last end is the last 1260. And so at the last end of this indignation in 1798, it says, for at the time appointed, the end shall be, or certainly the time at the time of the point appointed, the end shall be. Because for what, I am, just, what I am trying to do yeah. is, to pro- provide a support structure for your qu- for your question, okay. Because if we're looking, we're we're already seeing the historical application from media Persian Greece and Rome mm-hmm. as being evidenced for this time of the end, right? And and Daniel also though. Right. So I'm I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying that Daniel clearly is not just marking like the history of of pagan Rome. He's also marking to the end of papal Rome and the beginning of the Millerite history with this idea for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Right. In verse 17. And also at the the point of the end shall be right. So that time appointed and the time of the end are tied together. I am not attempting to disagree with you. Yeah, I know, and I'm not a disagreeing with you either. I'm just trying to clarify. Okay. So I'm just saying that so I'm agreeing with what you're saying. I'm just I'm just bringing in the fact that the time of the end and the time appointed are connected. So do we do we accept this symbolically that the way marks that had been shown for the end of this this time appointed, the end of the indignation, the progression from law and order to a an understanding of more philosophical situations, then led into the ultimate control that was exercised by Rome. Well, I'm not sure I'm understanding what law and order represented by the Medes and the Persians. Okay. Philosophical. Greece. Greece. And then here is Rome that basically takes control of everything. Okay. Now we. Yeah. So, so we know that we have this progression of nations and, and Rome is the one that's going to crucify Christ. Right. Right. Because it's the one that ultimately stands. Egypt is not going to stand. Correct. Right. It's going to be the power that crucifies Christ. So in this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, the whole issue is showing the rise of Rome in order to come against Christ. And 
persecute God's people. And then also the transition from the pagan aspect of Rome to the papal aspect of Rome, the last end of the indignation, in where we've now moved from literal to spiritual, and we're going to have now all of the events of Millerite history, which are which we're still involved in, even though we, we often don't realize it. That we're because Daniel eleven verse forty A and B refer to the time of the end which is a period of time that begins in 1798 in which we are still in. Now we can say, well, the history repeats in 1989, but really that time at the end that's being talked about here is, is 1798, yet it doesn't exclude 1989 because that history repeats. And that's kind of what it's saying, is it's saying that it's going to happen again, that that's built into this prophecy, which people don't notice. Right. They they don't notice it because it says for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And in English, we don't see what it's saying in Hebrew. Right. Correct. The Hebrew is telling us much more than for yet. So I'm just saying that that for yet the end shall be at the time appointed is saying that this is the appointed time. The end is going to be at what Daniel was talking about earlier in chapter eight, verse 19, that that time appointed is something still future. It's not the 330. It's not 330 AD that's being talked about as the time appointed. Because what what one is it doesn't, you know, when we get to verse 29, it's it's pretty clear that at the time appointed he shall return and come towards the south. Well, we would say that that's 1989, right? Isn't that true? That 1989 that the king of the north is going to return and come to the, towards the south. But it's not going to be as in 30, uh, 30 BC. And it's not going to be, uh, you know, as in the Roman time period later. So I'm not sure the latter one, which which specific event that would refer to. But then it's going to talk about the ships of Kittim, how they're going to be defeated. So I'm, I'm not sure. Or, or the latter could even refer to 1798 when the South defeats the North. But I don't know if that makes sense. I just think that there's a natural progression here dealing with this time appointed and the time of the end that's, that's being addressed in Daniel chapter 8. But it, it must be referring to the same time appointed. So when I was looking at this again from Daniel 8, okay, the translators were making use, and th- this is from the 1769 Bible, of Daniel 9.27, 11.27, 11.35, and in the current versions, including Esword, they don't look at Daniel 11.36, but they, they do continue on to Daniel 12.7 and Habakkuk 2.3. Mm-hmm. So each of these symbolically are giving us different elements of these waymarks so we can see how the door is being opened for this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. Right. So, and, and and what they're pointing us to is these longer prophetic periods. Correct. Right. The 2300 days, the 2520, the 1260, all of these have a part to play in, in Daniel chapter 11. Because remember, Daniel chapter 11 is an explanation of Daniel 8 and 9. Because Daniel has an understanding of 8 and 9. It's it's said that he understands the matter and the vision, right? Now he's going to be given a greater understanding, more detail. And so when we have things, I'll show you what shall be at the last end of the indignation. We obviously have to think about 1798 and that the time appointed there cannot be, you know, obviously if you're you're talking with Daniel 819, we know that the time appointed here is 1798. So there's no reason to put the time appointed as 3.30. It doesn't make sense to read this for yet the end shall be at the time appointed or at the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former as as the latter to try to put this as 3.30. It, it wouldn't make any sense that it's talking about something still in the future, saying that what's happening here is going to be repeated in the future. So, I mean, I would tend to think that the, that the former here that's referred to 
is the Battle of Actium and, the, and how that leads to the defeat of Egypt. And the latter is the defeat of Rome by these Germanic tribes. That's what I take the latter as being. So it's going to be the former, and then as the latter, which is the fall of Rome. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be different in, in certain ways. So And then it's going to tell us in what way it's, it's going to be different and what ways it's going to be the same. Right. That, to me, makes the most sense. But this is quite a bit different interpretation of these verses. Now, when you look at the Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes interpretation of these, because I've looked at them, they really have to ignore all of these little things that we pay attention to. You know, time appointed, what happens in Daniel, the 2300 days. Obviously, they don't look at any of those time prophecies as having any significance. In fact, they have to look at the time of the end in Daniel 11, verse 40, as addressing uh, the period with the Maccabees. Right. They have to have it all fulfilled in the second century B.C. because they don't believe that the Bible can write history in advance. So obviously the book of Daniel had to be written after the events. Right. That's the way they would look at it. So but we know that this is uh, that prophecy is history in advance. It's not written after the fact. And and it's taking this history you know, of Rome and putting it forward as this, the, the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. It's telling you plainly in the Hebrew that this is typical history, that what's going to happen here is going to happen again. And then it's going to lead you into the history of the time of the end, 1798. And then it's going to give you 1989. And then it's going to go back and, re so it's going to give you 1989 all the way to the end, right, to the to the Sunday law, to the end of the papacy. And then it's going to uh, bring you and, and give you bring you to the close of probation. And then it's going to go back and, and repeat to Daniel, you know, about the 1260, the first 1260. And then it's going to talk about the 1290 and the 1335 and how they're connected to the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. And that Daniel's prophecies are going to be understood in that period of time, the time of the end, until, you know, and, and Daniel's going to stand as his lot, you know, and then the 1335 is going to happen. And, and you know, so that's where Daniel's going to bring us to. But it's also going to, you know, bring us to the repeat of that history. And then the book of Revelation is going to expand on that and give us even more detail. So to me, this is a much better way to look at these verses than either Swearingen or Smith. And, and if I'm going to say anything that we've learned in the study of this so far, Daniel chapter 11, is the connection between Daniel 11 and, and the rest of the prophecies of the book of Daniel. Because many people just kind of, I mean, Swearingen goes in and looks at these other book prophecies as well and in Revelation. But we see here in Daniel 11 a much more specific reference to things in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9, right? Agreed. So this is going to take a little bit of, of rewriting. Now, once we start getting these things put on a line, you know, definitely we're going to see how this fits much more clearly. But uh, so if we're going to go back here, though, just looking at what we have. And, and both these kings, Octavian and Antony, their hearts shall be to do mischief. They both would both desire control of the Roman world, and they shall speak lies at one table. They form these false alliances. But it shall not prosper, that is, these agreements wouldn't last. And then when we have this section here for yet, the end, so we're going to say, you know, this word for is actually certainly and, and yet an iteration. The end, that is, uh, the extremity shall be at the time appointed. So we're not going to put this here as refers. We're going to say that this refers to the end of the prophetic periods. When I say that, I think they don't have iter Oh, yeah, I put iteration. Iteration, there we go. Then shall he, well, it can't obviously be Octavian and later Caesar Augustus. This just must be Rome. Or more specifically, the king of the north. 
So he is the king of the north shall return into his land. Would that be better? Like even not saying that it's Rome, but just focusing upon this king of the north aspect. Yeah, it's more broad. Okay, now you're, you're removing Octavian from one area and you're leaving him in another. Yeah, he still belongs there because where they say both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, that's talking about Octavian and Antony. Okay. Right, them speaking lies at one table. And then when it goes, but it shall not prosper, that's going to be addressing what happened there at the former time, right? Dealing with the Battle of Actium and the fall of Egypt. But then when it says, certainly this shall repeat it at the extremity that is at the time appointed. That's the way that I take that to, to, to be. So this is, so this history is going to be re, uh, repeated, right? And then it's going to talk about the king of the north just in a more general sense. He's going to return into his land with great riches in defeating Egypt, right? Now that could be, you, you could say it's Octavian and, um, that's going to be here, right? I mean, we could, we could put Octavian there and just say, well, it's, it's going back to Octavian. And, and it is kind of, but it's going to talk about his and pagan Rome's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. So, so obviously this can't be Octavian. So we're just going to put the King of the North in a general sense there, Rome. Because he's going to be against the Holy Covenant, that is Christianity, and he shall do and return to his own land, Rome. So Rome is is being talked about prior to, you know, the end of, you know, it's not the end of the Rome here. It's just saying that Rome is going to be set up and established. It's going to be uh, persecuting God's people. And then it says at the time appointed. So we're going to say we have to change this. We can't say between AD 330. Right. Which doesn't make sense. Can't be between that. Um, at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south. So this can't be this history that's being talked about in verse 29. So the time appointed has to be 1798. So, you know, the end of the prophetic period. So we'll put 1798. We could even say, you know, to 1844 if we wanted to. He that is pagan Rome, Constantine the Great, that can't be the case. And, and this Eastern territory. So we have to somehow figure this out. So, I mean, we can just simply say the King of the North, but it hasn't addressed yet the transition of the King of the North from pagan to papal yet. But so here we just put the King of the North. We're not going to put the papacy. Now he shall return and come towards the South. Now we could put, okay, um, maybe what I should put here, how about we did that? 1798 to 1989. Or we could even just put 1989. Here, I'm just going to put 1989. So I'm going to say the time appointed here is 1989. Let's try this. Uh, the king of the north shall return. So this is a reference to to the south. So he's going to return to the south. That is, well, we already have that in there. So we'll just leave that. Get rid of this. Return to the south. So that is going to be the battle. Well, can I ask a question? Yeah, in 1989, that's when um, that's when Ronald Reagan and Pope got together and conspired against Russia, right? Yeah, yeah. That time period. So, what was my question? The question was, then who who would be the king of the South? Would all right, the king of the North? That's that would be like um, a progressive healing of the wound, would no healing of the wound. I was saying progressively healing. Yeah, but it's not talking about the wound at all. I mean, I understand what you're saying, because you're saying 1798, 1989. Yeah, I, I guess I have a different view about the, the healing of the wound. I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I understand what you're trying to ask. The, the point here is I'm saying we could put the time appointed here as Daniel 11, verse 40b. That is, it's going to be talking about this time appointed, which is going to be the time of the end. And that time of the end has two different times appointed, right? One in 1798, one in 1989. Two different times of the ends, two different times appointed. So it shall not be as the former. So when we say the not be as the former, the former refers to the fall of the fall 
of Egypt, or the latter, the fall of Rome. That making sense, what I'm doing? Because then when we get to verse 30, it's going to refer to the latter. The ships of Kittim shall come against him, pagan Rome. Therefore, he... Now, we'd have to... So I don't know why we would put paganism and papalism shall be grieved. So this is going to be... I would just leave it as... That's just dealing with pagan Rome. He shall be grieved, return, have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So this is referring to the latter. It's not referring to... So when it says he shall return, this one I would put as the papacy. Right? And remember, we're just putting this here as a sketch to discuss this. And shall return, we put this 538, maybe. And I'm not sure what. Oh, I just underline this there. Have intelligence with them that forsake the covenant. Paganism enters Christianity, papacy corrupts and persecutes Christians. Um, paganism. So we'll do that. Right. And then it's going to describe this. OK, is that making sense? You can see how this is this flows a, uh, much better f- between these two histories. I mean, it's still going to be quite a bit of discussion about some of this as we go through it. And then especially once we get into uh, the present truth application, because what we're doing then is we're looking at in the present truth application that these histories are repeated within our history. Within, within the present. Any thoughts about this so far? I think this is a good start. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely different, but the other one didn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, it, it made sense in and of itself, but not with the Hebrew and not comparing scripture with scripture. If you follow Miller's rules, it doesn't align. Yeah, William? I think I'm getting it, but I was going to ask you, tell you, uh, I went back and looked up, um, Looked up the kissing on the ring of the Pope's hand. Okay. And all I found was a picture with a Pope handing a gift to one of the Seventh-day Adventist leaders at that time. And I think it was in 1960, 66, or 65, somewhere along in that area. He gave, um, the Pope, he kissed it. I know he didn't kiss it, but it, the Pope gave him a medal back then. And then in 17, 1977, Yes, when You're talking about the Pope giving a medal to who? The Seven Day Adventists. To to the Church itself. Well, to a to a man. I reckon he was Seven Day Adventist because that's what it read. It said he's Seven Day Adventist. Are you talking you about Sam, Samuel <clears throat> Bacchio? <clears throat> no, I don't think you. I don't know if it was him. Well, Samuel Bacchio got a medal because you know he graduated son of Tom Laud, and so he got a medal. Awarded yeah. from the Pope for, the for president got a medal too. Did that did that happen in 1960? 60, 60, I thought it was 66. If I remember right, 66. Well, you were saying or, 70, 70 something for the picture, but okay. Yeah, but he he gave he gave Pope gave Seven Day Adventist a medal, whether it's Sam Bakiaki, whatever his name is. Or, um, but in 17, 19, 17, uh, 1977, he, that's when we gave him a, uh, well, we didn't, but the, um, Africans, the Africans conference gave the Pope a, a medal. Okay. So, so 1977, the General Conference of Seventh day Adventists, according to Vance Farrell, yeah. I don't believe things just because Vance Farrell says that. Um, yeah. But he says they gave a gold medal to the Pope in 1977. But that was an African division, the conference. Okay, so it wasn't the general conference. It was a, uh, yeah, I think it was the African conference. Yeah, well, it says here, Dr. Beach, our representative in an audience with the Pope <laughs> in obeisance and offered our fealty to the Antichrist. So, I, I mean, this is more so I in Adventism, you know, ever since I became an Adventist, it's just every time, and I shouldn't say every time, sometimes some of these things turn out to be true, but often they are not. They're just things that are repeated that people, and especially in the past, because people didn't have the ability to to check up on these things. That is, we couldn't go on the Internet and find all kinds of different stuff and um, that could confirm or deny different rumors. So often we would just repeat things that we heard 
and 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 then when you start to find out the details, you know, it's not exactly the way that it was in reality. That is, it's based on some kind of truth, some kind of event. Um, so I just say, you know, I, I mean, I don't really make much of it, to be honest. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think that these are important details unless they connect somehow with our lines and with the chronology. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it would be interesting if we have a date in which, uh, because here he says the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists presented a gold medal to Pope Paul VI. Well, it's another article that said it, that it was the African division. Right. I mean, that- exactly. So that's what I'm saying is that there's these inconsistencies in these stories. Yeah. That sometimes <laughs> there's an actual event, but they get exaggerated. <laughs> And misrepresented, right? Uh-huh. And and that and I like just to have facts. Uh-huh. Well, the other thing, about, yeah. The other thing uh-huh. I was going to uh, tell you, um, I I kind of got um, I didn't realize that the ephod was part of the breastplate, but the breastplate is the ephod, ain't it? No, no. The ephod is the apron to which the breastplate is attached. Okay. Oh, right. well. so it's, it's 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 the garment to which the breastplate is attached by these rings. It's bound by these rings. Okay. All right. So if you take well, I look at courage and you add them together, you get uh whatever it is, um seven four zero five, and that word is bind, which is the word that you use to bind the breastplate to the ephod with these rings. Right. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, thanks for that. Okay, well, let's, uh, our time's up. Let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and for this past week of studies in the morning. We pray for the studies uh, tomorrow evening and on Sabbath. We ask for your presence in our lives and for your angels' care and protection. Um, help us in the struggles that we face each day. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.